So that's Susan the Wolf, that's Sheila the Wolf from the series Glow on Netflix, obviously very important for VCE. That's the cast from Teen Wolf, they were very important for my daughter when she was around about 15 or so, maybe for you guys too. That's Virginia Wolf, who you may or may not be studying if you're studying literature. And that's Susan Wolf. So Susan Rose Wolf, born 1952, an American moral philosopher and philosopher of action, who is currently the Edna J. Curry philosopher of, Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina. Okay, that's who we're dealing with. Wolf delivered her paper's meaning in life and why it matters as the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Princeton University, November 2007. The VCE course uh, focuses, well, just uses Lecture 1, Meaning in Life. Um, I've supplied you with both of these lectures, so you can read the second one if you want. Um, really, it's not until Lecture 2 that she starts to get into more uh, detailed exposition of what she thinks... Um, qualifies as a good life or a meaningful life. Um, lecture one is really, um, in meaning in life, she considers the two most common views of what constitutes meaningfulness before, before presenting and defending her own position. There you go. So most important for meaning, uh, there's a white chocolate Tim Tam and a cup of tea. So I hope you've all got your uh, supplies ready and we'll get into this. Wolf begins by observing that philosophical models of human psychology or more specifically human motivation, so that's what she's concerned with, tend to fall into one of two categories. In other words, when we look at why people do things, she says that we usually uh, whatever theory people have can be put into one of these two categories. One is ego egoists, i.e. guided by self-interest. And second is a dualist model, um, according to which people are capable of being moved not only by self-interest, by something else. So the dualist model just means that there is not only your self-interest, but there is something else, some other factor, an outside factor. Um, she points out that this is usually seen as being, or described as being, higher. Um, higher just in terms of, um, it has some sort of higher importance than even self-motivation, or motivation for the self. Um, she notes that there are descriptive models of human Motivation. So these are two terms she uses in her essay, which you should get your head around. Descriptive models, i.e., as the word says, they describe the motivation. E.g., egoism. That is a description. The motivation is ego-driven. Or prescriptive or normative. These are models, uh, pers prescriptive or normative models of human motivation. They prescribe, they tell you what to do. Normative, they tell you what is normal, what you should do. Okay. She goes through um, a range of, or oh, a discussion of egoism. Um, we have psychological egoism. We do act in our own interest. And we have ethical egoism. We should act in our own interest. It's just... Two different models, okay? Psychological egoism is telling us what we do do. It is, um, what's the word, natural, a natural model. And ethical e egoism, what we should do. Um, there is always that criticism that you should be aware of that when we set up this idea of ethical egoism, um, that it is prone to the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy, you will remember, is the idea that just because something occurs in nature doesn't mean that it 
is good or right. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of images on the PowerPoint here. You see the first one is psychological egoism and ethical egoism, just distinguishing those two things in our mind. We have this idea of egoism being um, driven by this is mine at the expense of other people. Um, but then we have ethical egoism um, or the idea of uh, helping ourselves first uh, because this is good for the greater um, the greater majority of people. Um, for example, the image there is one we hear if you ever go on a plane, if there's going to be a crash, look after yourself first because it's only if you look after yourself that you can help other people. So while that is an, uh, a form of egoism, is a form of egoism that aims at um, the greater good, a utilitarian good. It's all like a, a utilitarian egoism. And we also have the idea of egoism um, where we want to think about, uh, it's very tempting to think of egoism and think of the word selfish because you're putting yourself first. Um, but that's, you know, if you unpack this idea of putting yourself first, as this little picture sort of emphasizes, self-care is not selfish. So there's just some things to think about as we move ahead looking at egoism. All right, that's egoism. Um, she then talks about being motivated by something else. Remember, she's called this a dualist theory. Wolf refers to a dualist model. She's using the term in a similar sense to a Cartesian dualism, mind-body, um, simply to say that we have two things, dual. Uh, but in this case, it's more precisely self and other, where the other is taken as a motivating factor that is higher, more important than oneself. There's plenty of examples we can think of. Um, people are motivated by a belief in a higher power, whether it be God um, or the force or whatever you want to call it. That higher power, the motivation of that higher power, um, it's worthwhile recognising that for many people, the motivation coming from this higher power can still be egoist driven. So for example, for many people, their understanding of religion um, is what I would say is a simplistic understanding of religion is that it is simply reward punishment driven. If you're good, you go to heaven, you get a reward. If you're bad, you go to hell, you get a punishment. Um, in this case, while there is another that is separate to the self, um, the other is simply the source of this reward and punishment. So in the end, your motivation is still driven by self or egoist, um, ego is still ego driven. Uh, Kant put forward, and this is the one she mentions in her, Wolf mentions in her article, her lecture, she mentions Kant's uh, reason so that the other can be like this higher sense of reason. The other might be a sense of helping other people. Um, we then have to unpack questions about why we help other people. Um, is it because it is, you know, 
in an essay, you just can't say it's the right thing to do. You have to explain why someone might perceive it as the right thing to do. They might perceive it as the right thing to do because they were told by God that we should um, love our neighbour. So the reason why we help other people is because we were directed by a higher power. Um, it might be the right thing to do because by helping other people, we help ourselves. Okay, that goes back to um, what I was talking about a bit earlier about um, sort of a egotistic drive or in our behaviour, um, which appears to be directed at another, but is actually directed or motivated by our own self-interest. Um, and the other one she mentions is this idea of duty, which is, a, again, a tricky word. Where does, where does our sense of duty come from? She refers to Seasons of Love. Um, I was going to play the song just uh, because one of you had, or one of our students had expressed such love for musical theatre, but we'll skip that song. Reasons of Love. According to Wolf, Sorry, I just need to eat my biscuit. Oh, while I'm eating my biscuit, let me just take you back to our website and our page to show you something. So, travel with me here. Off to our page, Meaning in Life, and you'll see here the videos that I put under Wolf. The myth of Sisyphus. This will all make sense as we go through the um, the paper. Um, what is egoism? Um, the what is egoism is an interesting one, and one I I would like you to watch. It look what I'm wanting to point out to you here is they look at egoism, psychological egoism, ethical egoism and rational egoism. Ethical egoism is this idea, so this is a very good little movie that you uh, it only goes for 6 minutes and 22 um, it's well worth a watch, particularly this idea of ethical egoism ethical egoism is this idea that we that we act in an ethical way or an apparently ethical way but we do it for our own good so we might look after our, our neighbor but we do it because if we look after our neighbor that makes us stronger and means that we are more likely um, to to benefit ourselves, okay? Uh, contrast this with the idea of a pure altruism. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term, you should look up altruism and be able to contrast it with ethical egoism. Uh, there is a very good question we might ask, is, uh, is altruism even really possible? Isn't everything we do uh, in some way done for our benefit? Um, when I offer charity to someone, is that done so people see me offering charity and think what a good person I am? Even if I offer charity to someone without anyone completely anonymously, is it for the good feeling that I get in feeling like I have helped someone? Or is it because of a belief in um, an omniscient God that will know that I have offered charity and therefore I am earning points towards my 
reward in the afterlife? Uh, is it possible to perform a completely altruistic act? Um, I'm not certain I have an answer for you immediately right here, but it's the sort of questions that you want to be posing, uh, particularly when you're writing essays about this. Um, be aware of these questions. They are the questions that show the deeper understanding of what we're talking about. So let's go back to Wolf. Seasons of Love. According to Wolf, the egotistic and dualist models leave out reasons of love or non-personal interests. She uses the example of visiting her brother in hospital and helping a friend move. Um, visiting a brother in hospital, she says it, it doesn't give us anything. It's not an enjoyable experience. Uh, therefore, why are we doing it? We're not doing it for an egotistical reason. Um, and she seems to dismiss that there could be a, a motivating factor that falls into that bracket of other. That's questionable, given that we might say that we do this, we go to hospital to visit our alien brother out of a sense of duty, um, which she's already reckoned is recognised as one of these um, motivational factors which fall in the, um, the bracket of other. Again, helping a friend move might be because we feel duty bound. It might also be that we help a friend move um, because we're aware that if we help a friend move, when the time comes that we need to move, that friend may help us. So it may be again a form of ethical egoism. Anyway, from Wolf's point of view, she says that egoism and the dualist models leave out reasons of love. So she says, I do not believe that it is better for me, which would be the egoist model, and neither do I believe myself duty bound, the dualist model. That's debatable about why she doesn't feel that. Some other people might feel that. She says rather, she believes in these sorts of acts, we are motivated by love. Mm. Next she goes on to say that just because we call something um, a reason of love doesn't mean it is necessarily good. She's just recognising that she's using this term reasons of love purely in a, a descriptive way to describe why um, we might perform some acts. But she says just because they're reasons of love doesn't mean they're necessarily good. And she observes that um, not all reasons of love are good and she gives us a couple of examples. She might say that well, the first example is we may love our, we may have a plant that we love, a house plant that we love, and we know it needs water. So we water it out of love for the plant. But because we know it needs water and we love it, we think love, um, water equals love, therefore we give it too much water, and of course too much water will drown a plant and kill it. In a similar way, um, we love our children. Certain things we do for them, um, like, I don't know, when we give presents to our children, that shows love, makes the child happy, makes us happy, um, demonstrates love. Uh, so the more presents we give, the more love. And that can lead, of course, to spoiling a child. So spoiling a child would be another example where just because the reason was love doesn't mean it is a good act. There goes the last one, Vicky.
meaningfulness in life. Wolf moves on to say that what matters, in her opinion, is meaningfulness, that an act is meaningful. Wolf says that meaning arises from loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way. Again, meaning arises when subjective attraction meets objective attractiveness. It's just the same way, it's just a sort of more technical way of saying the same thing. Notice that like Aristotle, Wolf stresses that this conception of meaning specifies that the relationship between the subject and the object of her attraction must be an active one. There's a great comparison to be aware of because it's just a sort of um, comparison that you're likely to find in a short answer question in an exam or if you were um, writing one of the essays in section C and you were looking at Wolf, this gives you a great opportunity to sort of reflect Wolf against Aristotle. Now, Wolf explicitly um, recognizes Aristotle. Wolf observes that Aristotle is well known for employing the indoxic method. This is taking the accepted view as a starting point and testing this. Just be careful. Um, yes, Aristotle does use the indoxic method and that's what she's about to do as well. There is a temptation when we think of the endoxic method to think that the philosopher who is employing it is falling into the fallacy of ad populum, taking the popular view and saying this is the case. But I hope you've seen the distinction that when Aristotle is doing this and when Wolf in, in Aristotle's footsteps does this, what both of them are doing is not saying this is the popular view, therefore this is the correct view. That would be the fallacy of ad populum. Again, keeping in mind that just because it's a fallacy doesn't mean that the conclusion is wrong. It just means that the logic of um, justifying the conclusion in that way is, is flawed. Rather, the endoxic method simply says, this is what this is the popular view, this is the way that we think it works, so let's take that and use it as our starting point and test it. So instead of, so to speak, starting with a blank slate and going, we know nothing, let's take everything we've got and build up our theory, let's take a current theory and test that theory. That's basically all the endoxic method means. So in this spirit, as she says, Wolf sets out to test a view that meaning arises from loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way. She suggests her view is a combination of two more popular views. The first one she calls the fulfillment view and the second one the larger than oneself view. The first view tells us that it doesn't matter what you do with your life as long as it is something you love. Okay, so she's testing these two views to see if they hold up as um, justified in terms of producing meaning in life. So again, the fulfillment view. The first view tells us that it doesn't matter what we do with your life as long as it is something you love. The larger than oneself view. Um, the second view says that in order to live a truly satisfying life, one needs to get involved in something larger than oneself. Okay. Wolf calls her view the bipartite view. Simply saying bipartite, two parts. She's putting the two views together. Okay. For a life to be meaningful, both an objective and a subjective condition must be met. 
A meaningful life is a life that one, the subject finds fulfillment, okay? It doesn't matter as long, uh, what you do with your life as long as you love it. That is a subjective view. Um, but it, you gotta keep in mind, it says it doesn't matter what you do with your life as long as you love it. So it's purely subjective. The second view says it does matter what you do with your life because it has to be something that is larger than yourself and has to have an objective value. And she is saying that for a life to be meaningful, the subject must find it fulfilling. There's that subjective nature. And two, contributes to or connects positively with something whose value has its source in something outside the subject himself or herself. There is that larger than oneself view. Hence, a bipartite view. And then she sets about testing these views. So she starts with the fulfillment view. The first of the popular views I mentioned, the one that stresses the subjective element, urging each person to find his or hers passion and pursue it. Uh, these are all just quotes from her. Let us refer to the feelings one has when one is doing what one loves, or when one is engaged in activities by which one is gripped or excited as feelings of fulfillment, hence the name, the fulfillment view. Such feelings are the opposite of very bad feelings of boredom and alienation. Although feelings of fulfillment are questionably good things, are unquestionably good things, there are many other good things, perhaps more comfortably classified as pleasures, that have nothing to do with fulfillment. So there are there are pleasures, as she recognises, which don't necessarily um, give fulfillment. Pleasures, eating, drinking, sex, the sort of pleasures we associate with hedonism and within the context of our texts with Callicles. So those pleasures um, are good. They create good feeling. Um, Whereas the, what she's talking about with this, um, this idea is these, the feeling that one has in doing something that one loves is a feeling of fulfillment. She's distinguishing fulfillment from just simply good feelings or pleasures. Now, she says that someone whose life is fulfilling has no guarantee of being happy in the conventional sense of that term. Now the conventional sense of the term here, um, very much like I think what Aristotle does when Aristotle sort of says that there is a conventional sense of um, happiness uh, which is associated with wealth and honour Um, she recognises that just being fulfilled doesn't necessarily um, produce this conventional sense of happiness. In fact, it's possible to be fulfilled without um, the production of the obvious conventional uh, demonstrations of happiness. In fact, sometimes things we do which fulfill us can lead to, um, can present as being unpleasant. Um, some of the things we do which fulfill us can require hard work. And for all of you, you will finish your VCE. It will be hard work. It will not be what we commonly classify or conventionally classify as pleasurable um, and will probably not make you 
or not present, you won't look like you're happy as you're slaving away doing your revision for your exams. But once it's done, there may be that feeling, hopefully, of fulfillment. Okay, now that's a, that's a pretty solid um, contemporary example. It's probably one that will show up in the exams again and again. Because uh, most teachers will have used it with their students. But it doesn't mean you can't use it. It's a good example. So let's go back to what she said. The fulfillment view, as I have interpreted it, is a form of hedonism in that it's prescription for the best possible life, in which is included the possession of meaning, rests exclusively on the question of how a life can attain the best qualitative character. Positive experience is, according to this view, the only thing that matters. Okay. If the point of finding one's passion and pursuing it is simply to be fulfilled, that is, to get and keep feelings of fulfillment, then it shouldn't matter what activities or objects one has a passion for. Okay, And it's this last point that leads Wolf to consider the life, the life of Sisyphus and more importantly, the idea of Sisyphus fulfilled. Okay, So at this stage, she said, this is what the fulfillment view rests on, ideas of fulfillment. This is effectively a form of hedonism. If it holds up, it shouldn't matter what you're doing. So let's look at an example um, to explore whether or not we agree with that. Now the myth of Sisyphus, I, in the videos I've put on our page, um, I've included a couple that take you through the myth of Sisyphus. I've included um, also some videos on existentialism, which I, if I haven't already shown you, I strongly recommend you watch. Um, so you understand sort of the background to why she uses the myth of Sisyphus. The myth of Sisyphus is a Greek myth. Okay, let's go through it. Sisyphus or Sisyphus is a figure from Greek mythology who, as king of Corinth, became infamous for his general trickery and twice cheating death. He ultimately got his comeuppance when Zeus dealt him the eternal punishment of forever rolling a boulder up a hill in the depths of Hades. So it's probably a story you know. Um, I'll jump through this. The adjective Sisyphean denotes a task which can never be completed. Now, she doesn't talk about existentialism or Albert Camus, but it's worthwhile us having this in our mind. Albert Camus 1913 to 1960, key existentialist. One of his key ideas is that of the absurd. Camus, Camus' idea of the absurd is close to the thought of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. By Camus, for Camus, the absurd is a direct consequence of the absence of God. Without God, the discrepancy between human aspirations and the world is acute. The human condition is characterized by the possibility of suffering and the certainty of death, a fate which human reason cannot accept as reasonable. In the face of this absurdity, the universal reason of the Enlightenment has nothing to say. In the myth of Sisyphus, so Camus wrote um, an essay which turned a short, um, turned into a book. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. So, in the myth of Kis uh, Sisyphus, Camus he wrote this this essay, long essay, this book called The Myth of Sisyphus, where Camus elucidates this concept of the absurd. The absurd comes with the realisation that the world is not rational. At this point in his effort, man stands face to face with the irrational. He feels within him his longing for happiness and for reason. The absurd is born of this confrontation between human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. The myth of Sisyphus is a potent image of futility. 
Camus' response is that the only lucid recognition of the absurdity of existence uh, is, sorry, Camus' response is that only the lucid recognition of the absurdity of existence liberates us from belief in another life and permits us to live for the instant, for the beauty, the pleasure, and the implacable grandeur of existence. So let's just pause for a second. Before World War I and particularly World War II, generally, uh, generally reason, um, sorry, generally meaning, I should say, is found in a belief in another, that other being God. After particularly World War II and the horror of World War II, um, you get this sense that there is no God and you get a vacuum of meaning. For Camus, he's trying to make sense of this vacuum of meaning and he says that precisely by recognising that there is no other, what this does is it directs us to the instant now. So instead of trying to worry, I'll do this because it will give me something in the future, in heaven, or help me avoid hell, in an afterlife, in, an, in another, um, we become focused on the now. So for Camus, the lack of um, meaning, or the lack of um, another, a higher power to give us meaning means that we find meaning in the life we're living right now at this instant. That's at the heart of existentialism. Uh, existentialism covers a, a range of thinkers basically trying to address this idea that there is no other, no God. For some of them, they head towards um, sort of an idea or a belief that there is no meaning. Without there being a higher power to supply us with meaning, there is no meaning and everything becomes meaningless and therefore there is no morality, anything is allowed um, and you head towards sort of nihilism. For Camus, he found meaning precisely in if there is no God, no other, no other source of meaning, then all meaning comes in this instant. <coughs> now that's what he used the myth of Sisyphus to explore. So the fact that Wolf goes back to the myth of Sisyphus, um, she has this in mind. So it's worthwhile us having it in mind. So lucidity is the clarity and courage of mind which refuses all comforting illusions and self-deprecation or self-deception. Lucidity in Camus' notion is comparable um, Sorry, lucidity is Camus' notion comparable to Kierkegaard and Sartre's anguish. But in the end, Camus is more positive than either Kierkegaard or Sartre. Camus concludes that one must imagine Sisyphus happy. The final quote, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. That is what Camus says. So Sisyphus, in Camus' view, becomes happy doing what he is doing, i.e. pushing the boulder up a hill. The act of pushing the boulder, because there is no meaning coming from something other um, or after or outside or as a, of a higher value, the only thing that matters is the instant, the pushing of the boulder. And once Sisyphus is able to recognise this, according to Camus, then 
the pushing of the boulder becomes the source of meaning. So one must imagine Sisyphus happy. That is Camus' um, theory, hypothesis, theory, and that is what Wolf has in mind. So a few little, um, little images of Sisyphus there for you. Now, Wolf doesn't spend any time looking at Camus. All right, Wolf doesn't spend time looking at Camus. Instead, Wolf takes the myth of Sisyphus and turns to a thought experiment by Richard Taylor. It's this thought experiment which is most likely going to turn up on the exam. Um, either as a short answer question, but it's entirely possible that the thought experiment may turn up in some way um, Well, I'd say either explicitly as a short answer question in section A, or it would be a good thing to be able to use in one of the essays, I suspect. So let's have a look at it. Wolf recalls a thought experiment by Richard Taylor. In this thought experiment, Taylor suggests that the gods take pity on Sisyphus and inject him with a substance that makes rolling a stone the most lovable, fulfilling activity in the world. So now I hope, that's the thought experiment. I hope it now makes a bit more sense why I spent a bit of time talking to you about Camus and what Camus said about Sisyphus. Um, because basically Camus is describing the type of Sisyphus, Sisyphus that Richard Taylor is um, positing here. A Sisyphus who, because of, in this case, the drug, is focused on just the act of rolling the stone, where that act alone, even though that act has no objective value, that act gives Sisyphus the subjective fulfillment that would satisfy the fulfillment view. So the questions we're left asking is, is this now a good, meaningful life? Taylor believes so. And this theory is simply called Sisyphus Fulfilled. Right? Because Sisyphus is now fulfilled, happy, great. This is a meaningful life for Sisyphus, according to Taylor. Wolf is unconvinced. Wolf doesn't present um, an argument as such. Rather, she just says, I disagree. And then she says, let's look at some other cases and using those other cases, you should, um, you'll see why I disagree. Let's look at the other cases, but I suspect that Taylor would go, they seem fine to me. One might wonder whether the transformation that Sisyphus undergoes from being happy, unhappy, bored and frustrated to being blissfully fulfilled makes Sisyphus better off at all. One might think that it is actually makes him worse off. Wolf questions the value of certain activities such as smoking pot all day or doing crossword puzzles or worse Sudokos, which is just her sense of humour. Smoking pot, the, the drug addiction um, example is a really powerful one, great contemporary issue to use. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're writing your essays, you want to keep keep drawing all these philosophers uh, back to concrete examples. And drug addiction is a great concrete example and a contemporary issue, major contemporary issue. Okay, from a hedonistic perspective, of course, Sisyphus' transformation must make his life better, for the only changes in Sisyphus are subjective. 
replacing negative feelings and attitudes with positive ones. From a non-hedonistic perspective, however, these changes come at a cost. This is probably as close as the argument um, comes, or the, as close as Wolf comes to an argument. Here, Wolf is suggesting that the changes involve other changes which can be seen as damaging. According to Wolf, the drugging of Sisyphus may come at a cost. Um, the objective act, rolling a stone per hill fraternity, has not changed. The only thing that has happened is the subjective Sisyphus has changed. But how has he changed? Is this change for the better? If you think about drug addiction, um, or so someone, let's not focus on addiction, drug taking. So someone who takes a drug like um, heroin, um, look, ice is a very uh, pertinent one at the moment. People who take ice take it and there is a subjective change in their mind that means we could even use alcohol for, for quite frankly, um, a subjective change which means they feel happier. It may be that they feel happier because things that have been making them unhappy, um, depression, uh, bills, whinging kids, whatever it is, a uh, bad boss, um, uh, or any of these sorts of classic sorts of uh, factors that come up again and again about what makes people unhappy. Um, and so people take the drug and the, the drug dulls the awareness of these things, uh, meaning that the person has changed and therefore the person feels happier. But there's two things that we can also say are happening here. One is they're not being able to deal with any of those problems because they don't recognize they're there anymore. So the problems themselves may become worse. Um, and secondly, of course, with most drug addiction, well, there is a physical damage done to the person. Um, ice is that perfect example because if you ever had to, um, I don't know if you've ever done any sort of drug education and seen what ice does to a person, um, the physical damage to the body is horrendous. So while the person may think that they are happier and better and living a more meaningful life, um, their body is being destroyed to the point where they die. So have has Sisyphus changed? Yes. Is it for the better? In the case of drug addiction or drugs, we'd have to say no. Um, if I go back to Sisyphus, some people might want to argue that in Sisyphus's case, the drug that the gods give, so according to the scenario that Richard Taylor presents, the drug that the gods give Sisyphus makes Sisyphus um, believe that rolling the stone is good. Now, given that this drug comes from the gods and Sisyphus is already dead, so it's not damaging his body, we could say that this drug doesn't do any damage to the body in the way that, say, ice does. We could say that it does nothing but make the act fulfilling. So, in Sisyphus's case, um, is there any damage being done? This, I suppose, would come down to how you understood the role of punishment in the afterlife. 
particularly in the Greek afterlife. In pretty much every religious tradition I have and mythological tradition I have studied, um, where we find an afterlife with a form of punishment, that punishment has a purpose beyond simply retribution or revenge. Or The purpose is uh, to eventually lead the spirit to a point of recognizing that what they did was wrong, um, to a, a point of growth, to a point where they can progress in the spiritual journey. Um, this is definitely the case in Buddhism. Um, we see this to a degree if you look in the Christian models of hell. Uh, most of our Christian models of hell uh, we, we inherit through Dante's Divine Comedy, through the Inferno. Dante is a, a poet who wrote a, a poem called The Divine Comedy, broken into three parts. The first part is called The Inferno, which is the story of a journey through hell, where we see all these punishments. Um, in all these cases, these punishments are designed to grow the, um, the spirit that is being punished. And in this sense, they fit with Nietzsche's understanding of suffering, which is a good point to pick up. So even if Sisyphus was not suffering physically in the, in the same sense that uh, we would say someone who is addicted to heroin or ice or something is suffering physically, Sisyphus is not suffering physically, but Sisyphus is still, um, the change it has a bad effect in so much as Sisyphus will never recognize, but without suffering, will not recognize the need to change his situation. So he would be stuck, so to speak, for eternity pushing the, the stone with no chance of progressing. So that would be one response to that. From a hedonistic perspective, he's better because he now experiences pleasure from the act. However, according to Wolf, he is worse off because his intellectual powers are diminished. He is either afflict, afflicted by mental illness, is how Wolf puts it. He is either afflicted by mental illness or delusional or diminished in his intellectual powers. Um, so this is a good point for you to stop, probably grab a bit of pen and paper and write down what do you think the other philosophers would say about Sisyphus fulfilled? What would Socrates say about Sisyphus fulfilled? What would Callicles say? What would Aristotle? What would Nietzsche? As we've been going, I've been alluding to our other philosophers. Um, this is, a, I would say, if not this, um, if not in this current exam, this is going to turn up in this cycle. It is a prime um, question for one of the exam questions. Right. The larger than oneself view. The second view tells us that the best sort of life is one that is involved in or contributes to something larger than oneself. Wolf challenges this by first asking if this should be taken as quantitative matter. If we assume that the value of one person's life is as great as the value of another's, it would seem to rule out the possibility that a life devoted to the care of a single other person 
a disabled partner, for example, or a frail aging parent, or a child with special needs, could be meaningful. For the value of one cared for is presumably just equal to the value um, I think I've got the quote wrong. For the value of one cared for is presumably just equal to, rather than larger than, the value of the person who cares. No, it's the right quote. So you look at this picture we have here. We have a picture of a, an older lady in um, a care home and there's uh, maybe her daughter who's with her who will spend her days caring for, let's say, her mother. Is this a meaningful life? Or is one life being wasted for another life of equal value? When we try to assess projects and activities that are not principally aimed at the benefit of one or more human beings, the difficulty with such a view appears even worse. Presumably, a dog is not more important than oneself. But what about two dogs or six? And what about projects and activities that are not directed towards promoting one's, anyone's welfare at all? Is philosophy or poetry or basketball something larger than oneself in value? It is difficult to know what the question means. So, what is meaningful looking after? So, is, is your life or my life, or a single individual human's life, greater than the life of a dog? Um, and if you say no, you might say yes, but if you said no, then how many dogs do we need for this act to be meaningful? Two dogs? Three dogs? Five dogs? So, in continuing her investigation into the larger than oneself view, Wolf puts his quantitative reading aside to suggest that larger than oneself refers to something other, more important. That is, with something whose value is independent of and has its source outside of oneself. So, here she goes back to... Um, Sisyphus. Presumably, Sisyphean stone rolling has no such value, nor it seems does pot smoking or Sudoku solving. She obviously has a problem with Sudoku. But devotion to a single needy individual does satisfy this condition as much as devotion to a crowd. Philosophy and basketball appear to meet this criterion too, since the value of these activities, whatever it is, does not depend on one's own contingent interest in them. That's all that matters in this case at the moment. So she takes these views. Wolf combines the fulfillment view and the larger than oneself view to produce the bipartite view. In order for a life to be meaningful, both an objective and a subjective condition must be met. A meaningful life is a life that, one, the, sub the subject finds fulfilling, and two, contributes to or connects positively with something whose value has its source in something outside the subject himself. Wolf then basically calls this the fitting fulfillment view, and then she goes ahead to defend this. Um, meaningfulness in life came from loving something or a number of things worthy of love and being able to engage with it or them in some positive way. Wolf asks, ask asks apparently, let me just correct that. Wolf asks, what is distinctively good about loving objects worthy of love? Here, Wolf renames her bipartite view to the fitting fulfillment view. She emphasizes that the things one loves must be good in some independent way. Okay, so that not only do they have to have um, value outside of oneself, they have to be good. One may ask, how do we assess this independent value? Who is legitimately placed to make this assessment? Is it subjective? Is it possible to have 
objective value. And this is a problem um, that we face if we dismiss um, objective realities such as God or Platonic forms. Um, we then end up in a situation where a value or objective value um, appears to come from or is, is dependent on something. So it will be culturally dependent. Uh, a perfect example of this is the idea of beauty, which we can see um, throughout the ages different visions of beauty which were clearly, and are clearly, culturally dependent. Um, she finished this lecture one by saying she is not offering a theory of objective value. To do so, we would need to turn back to Socrates to find a theory of objective value. Socrates and Plato in the Platonic forms. Now, Wolf questions the idea of an objective measure of good. So she recognises that this is problematic. She observes a human tendency to see oneself from an external point of view. She notes Thomas Nagel called this the view from nowhere, and other philosophers have called it God's eye point of view. In addition, she says humans have a need to think well of themselves, a need for self-esteem. Now, again, this is not an argument. This is Wolf um, putting forward um, views to be accepted. Wolf suggests that these two needs are related to our need not to be alone. So this is very, uh, in a sense, driven by um, psychology, I suppose we would say. In a similar veil, she suggests that the advent of existential angst, think back to Camus and the existentialists, the thought that we exist in an indifferent universe, leads to humans needing meaning, which can be found in fulfilling engagement with projects of objective independent worth. So, Wolf is responding to existentialism. Wolf is saying that without meaning coming from a god, religion, what we're looking for is a theory of meaning. Um, and what she's suggesting is that this arises from the fact that we have a need not to be alone. Um, so we judge certain acts to have objective value. We judge this objective value because if I think it's valuable, you think it's valuable, and someone else thinks it's valuable, it means that we all share in an objective reality, which means we are not alone. We share the same view, on this at least, and so we are brought together in that view. This idea of engaging in a project of independent worth is again linked to the need not to be alone. Here Wolf suggests that if this project has independent, has worth independent of your judgment, then presumably this worth will be recognised by others. Therefore, others will appreciate our actions. The universal application, appreciation I should say, the universal appreciation of the worth of an objective project will unite the various subjects engaged in it. Hence, they will be in communion. They will not be alone. Um, this appears to suggest that the only way you can find meaning is in communion with others. So the question raise, rises, can there be meaning in solitude? 
Having suggested that the drive for meaning is possibly motivated, in part, by a need not to be alone, Wolf questions if the knowledge that fulfilling engagement with projects of objective independent worth might also provide meaning even when there is no notional awareness by others. That is to say, can there be meaning in solitude? Now, obviously, the person we would be going back to here to compare and contrast is Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, solitude is one of the key virtues. Wolf recognises the examples of a scorned artist or the lonely inventor and says that they may be sustained by the thought that their work is good and that one day may come to understand it. So if we look at the scorned artist, we can say that they love what they do. Um, obviously, they're not getting any money from it or any recognition from it. So it's probably hard. It's not providing happiness in the conventional sense, if we go back to that idea. Um, it's probably not providing pleasure in the conventional sense. Nevertheless, the scorned artists um, loves what they do. So that would be the fulfillment view. The scorned artist finds fulfillment in what they do. But if it is not recognised by others, that would question whether or not it fulfills their need not to be alone. However, Wolf suggests that in this case, um, there is the thought that what they're doing may one day be recognised. So whether or not it is eventually recognised, that satisfaction of not being alone is met by the thought, delusional or not, that one day this art will be recognised as objectively good, recognised by others. This still suggests that the motivation is a need not to be alone, even if the satisfaction of this need is delayed or delay, or put off to an imagined future. Wolf raises these questions in lecture one, but doesn't go much further than in answering them. What is interesting for us is to think of how this idea fits with our other thinkers. So let's have a look at that. Wolf suggests that meaning arises from loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way. She says that for a life to be meaningful, both an objective and a subjective condition must be met. A meaningful life is a life that one, the subject finds fulfilling and two, contributes to or connects positively with something whose value has its source in something outside the subject himself or herself. She says that this something outside must have independent value of oneself. She suggests that this independent, independent value satisfies our need not to be alone, our need for community. Her reference to an objective, independent arbiter of value might be seen as a circular argument. Acceptance of objective value a priori suggests Socrates and the realm of forms. Her reference to community sits well with Socrates and also Aristotle who work was concerned with the good of the polis. However, a reference to a desire not to be alone does not accord with Nietzsche, who says solitude is a key value. And that is Wolf.